The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of Neil Thomas Ministries. Hallelujah. For maybe anyone here, I don't know, I'm Peter Thomas, pastor here at Inner Life Church, and um, it's really good to be with you this evening and uh, be able to share the Word of God. Before I do, and even as I lead into my message tonight, I'd actually like to read, uh, before Jordan knew he was coming to Vanuatu at short notice, he wrote an email to um, myself and uh, his father, Pastor Francois, who overlooks the work on behalf of our ministry in, in Solomon Islands. And he just mentioned, I thought I would share with you what happened at Bible study last night. I was asked to take the combined study at NTM headquarters, Solomon Islands in Lunga. I spoke about one accord and how the Holy Ghost worked mightily through the book of Acts because of the one accord the church had. How the devil is constantly trying to bring discord by any means possible, doubt, offence, complaining or pulling down leadership. I felt to open the altar for anyone who wants to repent of any kind of talk or is offended. Three people came down. I then felt led to leave the altar open and just call for the people to come and pray for one accord. As in Acts 4, 23 to 31, they all together prayed in one accord that the Lord will give them boldness. And as it said, the Lord granted them and the place was shaken and all filled with the Holy Ghost and with boldness. Well, we started to pray and then asked everyone to sing as I'd really heard God say he's going to move in a mighty way. We sang from 8 till 10.30. During that time, it was like heaven came down, God came down. People were collapsing in God's presence, crying and crying. As I felt led, I prayed for a handful of people, and out of the handful of the people, two had very powerful encounters with God, visions. First, a girl, Linta, year three student, I prayed for her, and she hit the ground. It was like she was a fish out of water, and she was just saying, Jesus, Jesus, praying in tongues. She laid there like that for three hours. As I waited for her to wake up, I felt the Lord say, do not disturb her. When she woke up, I asked her, what did she see? She told me she was taken up into the sky. She saw Jesus sitting on a throne and an amount of angels she couldn't count. As she looked down, she saw the whole city, country, on fire. She said Jesus was full of white hair but couldn't see his face as it was too bright, the light. He stretched out his hand to her with something inside his hand that she, that she said was a circle and the circle was full of light. She said she wanted to grab it but she felt held back by herself. She then woke up and saw me, Pastor Ben, the principal, assistant principal with Jeremiah, and we were waiting for her. But behind us, she said, was Jesus, and she said he was very happy. Second, the boy Jonathan, only six years old, the son of Pastor Ben. As I prayed for him, he started to cry, cry, and cry, and I thought, what's wrong? But I heard the Lord say, he's fine, don't worry, my spirit is touching him. He cried and cried for hours. Near the end of his crying, he fell on his knees, saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Jesus is happy. So I sat with him after he stopped and I asked him what happened. He said, when you prayed for me, my body felt heavy and when I looked at your face, it changed like it was full of light, like the sun, like Jesus. He said, then a big, big, big mighty angel, it sounds like a six-year-old, doesn't it? A big, big, big mighty angel came down with his big wings and carried me up all the way to a place where it was all white. I saw Jesus on a big chair with hundreds of thousands of angels singing to Jesus. He said Jesus was happy. Much more happened during the time which I can't write about now. All I can say is it was such an awesome, powerful, beautiful and humbling time. Even these words don't describe it. It was God. I just wanted to share this with you so you'd be encouraged and blessed and know what God is doing by his spirit in the Solomons. Amen. Praise God. God is doing things. Answering our prayers, those that come and to our regular prayer times and we pray for these countries and we name and, you know, sometimes we say, Lord, pour out your spirit, come down, bless them, and then we go and get our coffee. But as we pray and, and really believe it, God will pour down his spirit and bless these people. Amen. And of course, they are praying there and uh, really a bit of our retreat, I guess, Jordan, Jordan took there and said, let's, let's believe for this. And Solomon's has been tough spiritually and so to see these sort of things happening there's been mighty healings and things taking place people are coming because the Lord's moving through the hands of his servants and Jordan's experiencing that Tim and Marvin had stories for me for people that they'd prayed for and healings and mighty things that they're seeing done at the hand of the Lord out in the bush particularly when they go out to the islands out to the villages and they see God work and meet needs that can't be met there. It's, there is no doctor, there's no surgeon, there's nobody there to, to, to really address the physical issue these people have. And the power of prayer, those issues are fixed. 
I was looking at an article on the, my way. I grabbed the Herald Sun flying home. I was in Sydney for an hour and I grabbed the Herald Sun off the free newspaper stand there as you go into the plane. Sorry, the Australian. And there was just an article in there. It stood out to me because I caught the word religion or church somewhere in the article as your eyes glance. So I went back and I read the article and the writer of the article was talking about the recent uh, terror attack in England. Unfortunately, another one today. But the recent one in, uh, that they were watching on the news about the one in Manchester at the concert and then somebody knocked on the door to talk about their religion. I don't know whether they, they mentioned who it was. But how frustrated and angry they are at religion and these, following these medieval beliefs and thinkings and doctrines and it's part of the problem in the world. It has no power. It has no meaning. And if anything, it's part of the cause of these sort of things that I'm watching on the television. And they were talking like this in the, in the article and... Um, you know, almost angry that in this modern day and age that people could still hold to such ridiculous thoughts and myths and medieval thoughts, you know, from the past. And, you know, you know, well, we do, don't we? In fact, hundreds of thousands of people do all around the world. Educated people, scientists, politicians, sporting people hold to those beliefs, hold to the beliefs about Jesus Christ. Because we don't just look at it through the eyes of so-called modern education and science because it is real. Because it is something that's real and it is something that's powerful in our lives. We're not just following some set of beliefs. And I was watching this thinking, but you've got it all wrong. We're not just following some set of beliefs. We're not just following some dogma or doctrine that's been passed down to us from people from the past, definitely has been passed down and it definitely has some doctrines and, and teachings, but it's alive and it's real. And that's why we're still following it. And that's why in this modern day with all these educated people, how could you follow this? Because it is real and it is alive. That's how come we can still follow it. How we can still follow it. I was uh, catching up on my Facebook today after three weeks and I saw a little, uh, little s snippet there from our youth leaders in New Zealand. And one of them was a young lady, Jasmine, was talking about her favourite verse. I met Jasmine two years ago. She's now uh, with Levon. They were together then and, and I think she had just fallen pregnant. And, uh, but he, he had come, come back to the Lord. He'd known the Lord as a boy and grown up in a church to his parents. He'd come back to the Lord now in his 20s and he had this young lady with him and he just said to me, I so want her to find Jesus. I don't know what to do. How are we going to move forward together in our relationship? We're already beginning to move apart. And I think she didn't want to lose Levon and she would come and sit in church and I sat with her once and she said, I just can't see it. I just, you know, I'm a very analytical person. And I'm sorry, I just can't see it. And something really needs to happen because I can't see this. I just can't believe this. You know, nice people and all, Peter, all of you, but I just can't see it. And here we are two years later and they've had a child and they're about to formally um, get married and she goes to the youth with him and she's on the Facebook sharing her favourite verse from the scripture and about how God loves you and how real he is and how wonderful he is. And you know what? Levon got Jasmine just to come and be around this life. She was someone who thought like that article I read from a distance, but when she came and spent time in the life, of course she could see it. She could see and she, she realised and she experienced that these people are with something very real. And when she saw prayer works and when she saw lives changed and when she saw people, she sat and watched people come with some real issues and she saw their lives change, she saw their face change. She started to think, my goodness, there is actually power in this thing. Stopped trying to analyse it and understand it all, but rather just accept it, yeah, as the truth and, and as something that's real and that's touching people's lives. And, you know, here she is now helping young people and speaking to young people and finding scriptures and saying, boy, this, this has been my experience. This actual scripture has been my experience. Because, you know, Jesus is real, yeah, because it's a personal relationship that we're talking about. It's not just a mantra that we repeat or a view of the world or teachings and doctrines that we've learned, but a personal relationship with God. And if I thought of the writer of that article, I thought if you could just come and spend a couple of months and hang out at 18 to 25s on a Monday and come to a Bible study on a Wednesday and go along to youth group, just come and sit among, be amongst us. Not just come and even sit on a Sunday night and take notes about my theories, but actually come and live amongst the people. Who are, who are experiencing this life, you'd see it's not just a set of doctrines and dogmas that we follow, but hey, we, it's a life-living relationship. And part of that is an opportunity to talk to God and pray, as we began to speak about this morning in Taylor's Hill and here I know Pastor Sonia shared. Part of that is that power of prayer, yes? Come and see what that relationship can really do. 
come and see that we've experienced the truth of the fact that Jesus Christ was the Son of Man and the Son of God. There's no doubt to those who want to look, I guess, with human eyes that this man obviously existed. History, there's just too much history to say that he did. There's too much evidence to say that he did. Too much evidence that backs up the New Testament. There's, there's thousands and thousands of pages and, and the sort of evidence that backs up the teachings of men of that time. There's so much more that backs up Christ. And yet they question Jesus and yet teach in school the theories of these others. And there's so much less on them than there is on Jesus. Because Jesus did exist and he impacted people's lives so much that a heap of people wrote about him. Much more than you know, Aristotle and some of these others. Eh? Because of the effect he had on their life. And you know, there's a, it's the biggest selling book about him because of the effect he had on people's lives. Because it is real. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there just talking it and it's not real. There's a lot of religion that's come out of it, but it is real if you want to truly lay hold of it and you want to receive it in your heart. That Jesus, both Son of God and Son of Man, he came and took our place. And I've been reminded, I guess, on this trip as I've travelled that he, the, the God became man so that he could fix up our man problems, our human problems. We had a human issue. We had this separation from this power of God in our life. And Jesus came and he became human like us and he died in our place and he rose again from the dead to defeat the force that was separating us from what God had planned for us. It, it needed a, a human to do it. It needed a man to do it. It needed a person to do it and Jesus became that person for us. God became a person so he could fix up that issue, yes? Resolve the issue that makes us at times, you know, we feel bound or we feel lost or we feel frustrated. So much of life, so much of the movies, so much is all about people trying to get the answer to life and find the meaning to life and feel like their, their life is worth something and address all those people in your life that are robbing you from feeling happy and feeling good about yourself and feeling like you've made it. You know what? That's the frustration of not being connected to the Father. That's just the frustration of not knowing God, your Creator. And they offer all these other ways of, of, of fixing that up and getting that power back and getting that sense of worth back and getting that sense of purpose back in your life. But the only place to truly find it is in God. And the more we seem to throw God away, the worse things get. And they talk about evil and they talk about terrorism and they talk about how bad it's getting. And we say that Jesus is the answer and they say, we don't want that answer. And things just keep getting worse. The answer is Jesus. He is the answer to the terror, the personal terror you might have about your own future, the personal terror you might have about something you fear in your own life, your own, your own terror about the physical things, your own terror about your health, your own terror about your future and the terror for society, the answer is Jesus. The things that we fear, the things that we worry about, the sense of I'm disjointed and I'm not happy and this other person, you know what, nobody, nobody's robbing you from your happiness, it's, it's only going to come from the Father. It's only going to come from your connection with him. And some of us have even said we believe in him and we follow him, but we still feel like, you know, other people are robbing me from my joy. I'm telling you, nobody can. It's, it comes from God. Amen. Don't give them that power. Don't give the devil that power. Don't make yourself a victim of what others have done or the past or how my situation is. It doesn't need to be. Because we learned this morning about the power of prayer. The power of prayer is it's your connection to the almighty God, the creator, your dad, your father. It's your connection to what is going to fulfill you. It is your connection to what will give you peace. And it's your connection about the power that can even do something about your circumstances. And change those circumstances, yes? And actually make a difference. Jesus is the one who fixed it all up on the cross. If you're here tonight and you've never ex accepted that and, and laid hold of that for yourself, you saw tonight we baptised two people, we put them in the water. Why in the water? Because the Bible tells us that's the, that's the, the, the act, the practice God said. If you will baptise into me, it's like you're joining my son in his death and in his resurrection. Man's turned our animated into church. We don't baptise people into religion. Baptism doesn't join you to a religion. Baptism doesn't do, it's nothing to do with your culture or where you come from. Baptism's joining into Jesus. And putting your life into him and rising again from the dead with him. It's sharing with him in his death and resurrection. And if you've not been baptised and you're listening to me tonight, you really need to get baptised for everything that I say after this to become a reality for you. From here on in, you're going to be hearing stuff and it's only going to be real if you get baptised into Jesus. 
Once you are, you have then the right to access all that he did for us, yes? Jesus made this doorway for us to have a relationship with God and for God to become our Father. Jesus made that doorway for us, yes? We read about it this morning, I believe here, or we certainly did in Taylor's Hill from Matthew chapter 6. I'd like to have a look there if you've got your scriptures. Because you know what? God wants to be your Father. God wants to be a Father to you. We've all got a Father issue We have all need to make connection with our dad and when connection with your dad is where you're going to find that fulfilment and that wholeness. And the only true dad that can do that for you is your heavenly father. Your human father and mother were only ever here to, to be a vessel through which your life would be born, your physical body would be born, but the life inside you would come from your father in heaven. His image was to be put inside of you and that came from him. And that was to come from him. We lost that when man said, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to listen to the serpent. I'm going to listen to the devil. I'm going to follow his ways. But God wants to be your father. And we read in Matthew 6, 9 and 10, when Jesus was teaching us how to pray, he said, pray, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He told us to start the prayer with recognizing God as your father. Hi God, you're my dad. Hi, God, you're my dad. When you go to pray, he says, start off by acknowledging. When you go into that place to pray and speak to God, start off by acknowledging that he's your dad. Amen. And then the second thing to, is to commit to is to represent him as holy. Hallowed be your name. To hallow something is to treat it as holy, respect it as holy. It's not just declaring it, holy is your name. It didn't say holy is your name, but to be hallowed, to be treated as holy, to be represented as holy. God, you're my dad and I'm going to represent the family holy. You deserve for me to walk holy. How can you go any further if you don't understand holiness? That's why it's so important that somebody knows that they're holy and understands that Christ has made them holy and that they have, because of that, have the right to know their holy dad and be a holy person, which simply means God-like. You've now been born like God and you can represent God and you can be like God and represent his name wholly in your life. God, you're my dad and I hallow your name. I, holy, I treat your name as holy. I represent your name as holy. Your, your name deserves to be treated and represented as holy. Your kingdom come and your will be done. You know, that's what... That's what our prayer should be. That's what, we can, that's what we now have the authority to do, to bring God's kingdom down and to see God's will carried out on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Verse 6, this is how he told us to pray when we go into the secret place. He said, when you pray, go into your room and when you've shut your door, pray to your father who's in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You know what, tonight I want to remind you from our messages this morning that there's a secret place and, and God the Father is waiting there for you. He's actually waiting there for you in that place. The omnipresent God who is everywhere, he's also in this place and it's a room for you and him and he waits there for you. He waits there for you. And, that, and if that is a, a real and a living experience for you, you know what, what anyone else says or does really won't matter to you. Of course, it'll, it'll be a trial to you and it'll be something you have to deal with in life and it'll, it'll buffer you around, but your joy won't be based on what others or do or don't do. You, don't, you won't give them that power. You won't have to because it's with your Father in heaven. You know, we feel out of sorts. We feel like things aren't what they should be. They could be better and we blame others for it. You know, we're so often looking for love. That's, you know, to be valued. We're looking for power. We're looking for fame. We're looking for something. We're looking for attention. We feel like I'm not appreciated. You, hey, you're not in the secret place, obviously. You don't know God because you don't feel like that when you know him. When you know the Father, you won't feel that way. You won't feel that way. You know, when someone close to you sort of says, you know what, no one appreciates me, you kind of feel like, well, I do. <laughs> I don't have any friends who think, oh, because I, th I thought I was one of your friends. But anyway, <laughs> it's a bit like that, I think, when we say to God, you know, nobody loves me. He thinks, well, I do, and I'm the almighty God that created everybody else you're trying to get love from. What's your problem? Come on. I love you. No one appreciates what I do. He says, well, I appreciate what you do. No one can reward you like I'm planning to. What are you talking about? 
Well, you know, no one knows me. I'm not very important. He says, well, I've already committed and made an avenue for you to sit and share my throne with me in glory forever and ever. You'll be pretty important then. What's the problem? But of course, if we're in the world and looking for all this from the world, we're going to feel frustrated because it actually can't give it to us. It actually can't give it to us. And as men reject this offer of life from the Father through Jesus Christ, we've gone crazier and crazier about trying to lay hold of it. And in the end, there's this few, this tiny few that seem to say they're in a place where they're happy and they're a tiny part of society. They're the few with the money at the top. They're the ones running around saying, writing articles like, oh, it's all irrelevant and it doesn't mean anything. You know, the, the media, the, the, the elite sports stars and, and the movie, the, the celebration, the, cel- uh, the movie stars and the music stars, you know what? If you added them all together in Australia, they probably come to a community of about 20, 30,000 people. And yet they, they represent how we all feel all the time how everybody feels. The truth is everybody feels distant. Everybody feels a little bit empty. Everybody feels frustrated. Everybody feels scared. Everybody's a little bit terrified. And that small group of people, they really don't represent how we all feel. And you know what? They're feeling okay because right, at, right now they've got the fame, they've got the power, they've got the attention, they've got the success, and they make up something like you know 3% of us. But most people don't have that. Most people are saying, I'm frustrated, I'm unhappy, what's my life about, where am I going? I want to get where all of them are. And of course, when you get up there, you find out half of them are on drugs and really unhappy. And they seem to die young and it's not really as good as they all say it is. They've convinced themselves that they've, they've, that's where, that, where the power is, where the joy is. But you know what? It's not. It's in God. And we're not following, like I said, some just set, some set of doctrines or some myths or some fables from the past or some dogma that's been passed down, but rather we are living a, a, a life that's alive. And I want to tell you tonight that, you know, as we're talking about prayer this month, we're talking about prayer because prayer is powerful. Prayer is, can be real in your life. Prayer can change things. Prayer will move. If you'll take the time to find out how that happens, you know, one scripture actually says you don't have because you pray amiss. You pray wrong. So if you, say, well, if you want to tell me, well, I do a lot of praying, it hasn't happened, I'll say, well, you're praying wrong. You want to take time to learn how to pray right? This morning I was invited in Taylor's Hill to interpret the tongues and we are just singing songs about um, you know, Jesus relieving us and helping us and it really struck me again that, that word and I really felt the Holy Spirit say, you know, Jesus said, Come unto me, or ye who are heavy laden, or you who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and my burden won't be heavy, but you'll find rest for your souls. But you've got to learn from me. Learn from me how to handle the burdens of life. He didn't say he'll take them away. He said, in the world you'll have trouble, but I've overcome the trouble. But he said, learn from me. But you know, and, and, and how are we going to learn from him? He says, well, go into the secret place and talk to the Father. I want to introduce you to God. I want to get you back in connection with your dad. I want to introduce you to your dad. You know, that's a powerful thing even on a human level. And I have been privileged many times to help people make connection back with their dad. And I see the good thing it does for them. Even sometimes just meeting their dad, it, it can just settle or resolve something when they've never met their father. Or got to know their father in the human it, it settles something well imagine what it can do for the inner man the spirit man when he's now made in contact with his father in heaven and what does jesus say here go into your room and when you've shut your door pray to your father who's in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly you know this secret place prayer time that's what results in the open reward and the change and renee referred to it tonight She's, she's seen the, the time given to prayer and fasting in New Zealand and, she's, and she says we're seeing the results of that time spent with the Father. That, that, that's being seen openly in the lives of people who are spending that time with the Father. And I really desire we're talking about prayer this month because as we mentioned at February at the start of this year, the book of Acts is our model for this church. That's the model for the church you're attending. That's our model. Our model isn't going to be something else of, of a more modern. It's going to be that. That's our model because that's what needs to happen for people to have a real experience with the Holy Spirit. And so we want to see that happening. And so we did, a, we did a month on faith and now we're doing a month on prayer. If you can see, there's a connection, yeah? 
so that we might know what it is, what, what faith is, and then we might take that faith and, and start to apply it to learn what prayer is and what prayer really can do for us. And the prayer isn't just about us asking for God, it's actually speaking what we've heard from God. And as was explained this morning, prayer is about going to God, uh, is about speaking to things because we've spent time with God. And Jesus went to pray so he knew what to say. He went to pray so he knew what to do. How to bring God's kingdom to earth. What to do, how to address, what to do with the issues. And I've never liked, I've heard it out of my mouth, I mentioned it this morning, and I've never liked it when I hear myself say or others say, well, I don't really know what's going on, but you know, God knows, he'll do what he wants to do. No, no, he doesn't keep secrets from us. There is an end, there is a reason. We can find out, we can get into the secret place, we can speak to him. He wants to bring his kingdom to earth. Jesus said, I only do and say what the Father tells me to do and say. Jesus said, I don't even speak my own opinion, I only speak what he says, and the things you see me do, I saw the Father do before I did them. Brothers and sisters, we need to get into the secret place. Friend, this relationship with Jesus, this baptism that you saw tonight with Vicky and Mark is a baptism into the life of Christ. And as I prayed for them and the Holy Spirit said, he wants to show them things. He's going to speak to them. He wants to reveal things to them. He wants to open their mind. He wants a personal relationship with them. Yes, they need people to get around them and help them and teach them. The Bible says that when we're first baptised, we're like babies. We need help. But as much as I love my granddaughters little, if they stopped growing and they didn't grow up and their intelligence didn't increase, we'd all be worried. We, you know, we say often, oh, we wish they didn't grow up. But if they didn't grow up, we'd all be at the doctors panicking, wouldn't we? We want them to grow up. And, I, and if I live long enough, I don't want to come to my, my son-in-law's house and find my 35-year-old granddaughter living there looking like she's three and, and sitting on her daddy's lap. I want her grown up and giving me great-grandchildren if I'm still around by then. Let's, let's get some scores on the board here and call ourselves great-grandpa. Because we, we, we want them to grow up and move on, move out. We want them to come into their own life, yes? And that's what this is. God wants a personal relationship with you where he's speaking to you and he's showing you what it means for his kingdom to come in your life. And you're going out and you're speaking it because you know it, not wondering what it is. Not afraid, not scared, not, not blaming everybody else for the kingdom not coming in. He's saying, no, you, you speak the kingdom in. If you believe, he said, you can tell this mountain to move and have no doubt in your heart. Well, how do I deal with the doubt in my heart? That's what this prayer seminar is about. This prayer, this month of talking about prayer, you need to come along and we need to hear about it and talk about it, yes? God gave men and women power to give life. And God, knowing you would be, be born, he designed you for a purpose. He, knowing you would be born, he designed you for a purpose. And you know what? That purpose is his kingdom. That purpose can only be found in him. That purpose requires a secret place relationship. My friend, you need to have a secret place relationship. If you are baptised and born again, you need to have that secret place relationship. It's not something you need to say, I need to pray a bit more. Yeah, I know I need to pray more. You know what? It's vital. It has to happen. If you're, talk, if you're not talking to him much, you're like the guy that said, yeah, I know I need to pay my wife a bit more attention. I've seen this. I've heard this. Oh, I know I need to spend a bit of time with my husband. And when they find their partner's gone, they're absolutely freaking out that they've now lost the marriage. But, you know, the thing they kept saying they needed to fix, they didn't fix, they lost it. Can't be saying, oh, I know I need to spend more time with God and I'll, do, I'll get around to that. You need to do something about it ASAP. You need to do something about it now. You need to do something about it tonight. Because there's, there's challenges coming. So when those challenges come, you're not in a panic because you know how to hear from God about what to do. You've gone to Jesus and you know, you know how to carry this burden. You've learnt from him what to do in this situation. Come unto me, he said, if you're finding it, things heavy. Come unto me. I'll yoke to you. I'll, I'll join myself to you and I will teach you how to pull this load that you've got. We're not here tonight to say that you know, God takes away all the load of life. He said, in the world you'll have trouble. He said that the, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of darkness are going to fight against the kingdom of God coming into your life. But he said, in that fight, don't worry. I'll yoke to you, I'll join with you, I'll, I'll teach you and I'll walk with you. And he actually said, you'll actually find it a lot easier than you think. I'll make it possible for you to go through what it is you're going through. And to get through it, yes, and to carry it through. Psalm 139 tells us that God has that purpose. He says, in, in, before you were born, when you were being formed in your mother's womb, God had already written a book, and in that book are all the days ordained for you. 
God has a purpose for your life, friend, and it's a purpose towards his kingdom. When I hear when people don't want to, they don't want to know about that, they just want to go and do what they want to do, that's when they're going to be frustrated and annoyed and feel like there's all this and I'm not happy and why are these things in my way and why isn't, because you're about what you want to be about. But if you'll get into that secret place, you'll get to know your father and you'll get about what he made you to be about, Jesus said your joy will be full and you'll be full of peace. That's what being a Christian is, if you're here tonight. Being a Christian is getting in contact with God. Getting into that relationship with the Father and having a, a, a personal talk with him and hearing from him and hearing his voice. While I was away, there was two scriptures that really stood out to me when I was teaching. One was, uh, I was listening, sorry, and one was our vice principal, or well, first of all, P- President Seth, Tadamat Seth, shared at a retreat. And I'd like to read from uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. And he was reading this passage about Jesus' appearance in heaven. And Jesus appears in heaven as a lamb freshly slain. Jesus appears as that sacrifice that he is that Vicky and Mark joined themselves to tonight. He appears alive but as if he's just died. He's a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. And I read from chapter 5 verse 8. It says, Now when he, that's the lamb, had taken the scroll... The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So I'm reading the Apostle of John's vision, yes, for those that maybe don't know this. And, and he says, and they sang a new song with these prayers of the saints. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. You've redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you've made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Do you see that last verse 10? That's about you and me. You have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. You've made us priests and kings. Jesus died and he rose again from the dead to put you back as king. To put you back as a priest. Priest, one who hears from God. One who doesn't have to run to a priest because he is a priest. Because he hears from God. He goes into the secret place and he talks with God. He speaks with God. Friend, how's that going? How, how does your heart feel even when you hear that? You feel like, oh, more pressure to be more spiritual. You need to get to the altar if that's how you feel. Your heart's not in a good place. To be a king. To be a king. Priests and king to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And so, so when you go to pray, he says, pray for God's kingdom to come. Pray for, the, for your work as a king. Pray for your work as one who is a leader in the kingdom and brings the kingdom of God. Pray for your authority that you've got from your father who's holy and for that authority to bring the kingdom of God to earth, to bring God's will to earth. Because, hey, you are a priest. Jesus is declared the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, you know, and I often thought of that being he's the King of, you know, the King of Sweden. I think they got a king. And he's the King of the King of England, the King of Spain. I know they have a king. I just think he's the King of Kings. And so he's the King of the, you know, he's the King of the Prime Minister of Australia. He's the King of our earthly kings. But, you know, of many of them, he's not the King of because they don't make him their King. He, they do not submit to him. Who's the King he's King of? He's King of us. When it says he's the King of Kings, maybe you're the King he's King of. You are a king in the kingdom of God. Yes, you're under the king of kings, but you too are a king because you've been given that authority we heard this morning. You've been given the authority. Again, is that like, oh, Pastor Peter, just leave me alone. I just want to go to the footy. I just don't want to just leave me alone. I just want to have a baby. I just just want to find a husband. Can you just get off my back? King of kings. No, it isn't supposed to be a burden to you. That's why Jesus said, if all this is a burden, come to me and and learn from me. It won't be a burden to you. It's not supposed to be a burden. Christian, if it feels like a burden, then tonight come to Jesus. If, If getting to prayer is a burden for you, come to Jesus. If praying is a burden, come to Jesus. If, you know, if you said to me, being with my wife's a burden, I say, get to the marriage seminar. 
If being with your wife is a pleasure to you, that's good. Now, I don't mean when she's annoyed at you. Or, you know, I'm not saying every moment, not when she's really annoyed at you. I know that maybe not. Or I, not, not me, I mean when he's smelly and he needs a shower. But if being with your partner is annoying to you, a burden to you, your, that relationship's not in a good way. Just as if you know, going to work is a total burden to you, we need to look about where you're working or what's going on. Hey? If something is a big burden, well, if prayer is a burden to you, you don't obviously know what prayer is. It's not a burden, it's life. It's access to the throne room of God. It's time, with, it's time with the one who will make you feel like you're worth something. It's time with the one who can be, do the best for you. It's the time with the one who can show you your future. It's the time with the one who can tell you what to do when you're in trouble. It's the time with the one who can tell you, show you the kingdom so you can go out and bring it. It's something real important to you. It's something you're, you're hanging to do. And you want to find time to do. It's not something that's going to be like, oh, they talked about prayer again. So I guess I better pick that up again in my life. I say that because you know, I've grown up in the church and there were those times. Those times when the youth leader said, who prayed this week? And everyone put their hand up. You thought, you're all lying. Now I have to put my hand up too. So we all put our hand up in year eight. Not one of us had really, but we all thought we put our hand up because we said, I said grace. I remember saying grace at one point. Because we didn't understand the power of that. Praise God, in my teenage years, I did come into an experience with this father. You know, because he, he's, he, he's longing to have this relationship with you that you might understand the king that he's made you and the priest that he has made you. And the one other scripture that really stood out to me, in Luke 22, and this one I had never seen before, and this was the vice principal of our college in Vila, great young man, Kashena, his name is. He's married Joanna Lovis, those who know Joanna. I've got my eyes on them, future leaders. And Luke 22, verse 29 to 30, and Kashena was giving the communion talk at our retreat, and he was sharing, and he read from this passage, and I guess it had, it had jumped out at him as he prepared because we'd been doing the retreat on the kingdom of God. And so I'll read from verse uh, 19 to the context is Jesus is introducing the communion and its power. He took bread, he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table and truly the son of man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which one of them it was who would do this thing. And also a dispute rose among them as to which of them should be the, considered the greatest. It was a, obviously a, it was a relaxed dinner time, yeah? It wasn't quite as formal as our little communions we have down here, was it? And he said, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. They're the ones who benefit because they're, they, they're the lords and they get all the benefits of being the leader. But not so among you, on the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits on the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. But you are those who've continued with me in my trials. And have a look at this. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Wow. He bestowed on these that believed in him and shared in this communion with him a kingdom. Well, that's made me look at communion a little different. I come to take the communion to re again, reaffirm again that I've been given a kingdom. Friend, you've been given a kingdom. You're a king. We read it in Revelation 5. You're a king to reign upon the earth and you've been given a kingdom. Your own life to begin with, it might be your family, it might be some responsibility in ministry, it might be your job is your kingdom, your business is a kingdom. What kingdom do you have in your hand that you should rule and bring the kingdom of God into? And you're sort of bl blaming everybody else and waiting for God. And God's saying, I've given you a kingdom and I've given you the authority. As Pastor Sonia would have shared this morning, you've got this authority. Prayer is the authority. Prayer is our ability to, to make connection with the King of Kings and the Kingdom of Heaven and bring it to earth to the kingdom for which we have been given. You have been given a kingdom. You have a kingdom. Every one of us. 
Every man was made to rule upon the earth. Adam was told, I put you down here in my image, holy like me, now go and have dominion, have domain, dominion over the domain. Kings have doms, they're called domains. Go and have dominion over the domain that I give you and keep making babies and start spreading these little kingdoms everywhere till you fill the whole earth. Take the earth back for me. You felt like a victim, you still feel like a victim, you feel like you're pushing against everybody else. Well, in fact, my friend, Christ came and died on the cross and rose from the dead. He became a man so he could restore back to men the kingdom. And so you could have a kingdom and you could be a king and a priest. A king who was also a priest. A king who doesn't have to go to the priest to get advice like they did in the Old Testament, but a king who can go into the Holy of Holies, talk to the Father, see what's supposed to be and go out and say, this is what's going on. A king that can see what's going on. Jesus walked into a house where there was a dead girl and he said, she's not dead, she's asleep. And he considered her asleep because the father had showed him that she she would rise from the dead. He didn't go and raise her up because he just thought, I've got the power and I want to do it. He did it because he heard it from the father in the secret place. He said, I don't do anything that the father doesn't tell me to do and I don't say anything he hasn't told me to say. How do you know what to do and what to say? Because he spent time in prayer. Christian, if you're not spending time in prayer, you'll have no idea what to do and say to bring the kingdom down, to, to, to lead the kingdom that he's made you responsible for. But you do have a kingdom. And Jesus tells parables that if you rule well, the kingdom he's given you, he'll give you more kingdoms. You don't get authority with Jesus by inheritance. You don't get authority with Jesus because of who your family is or your dad is. I can't give you authority with Jesus because I like you and I can't give it to my son because I want to give it to him. If he has authority as the principle, it's because he's got it from God in the secret place. I can't give it to him. I can't give it to Adam. I haven't, haven't given something to Adam Ganae that I could have given to someone else. Mr. Thomas didn't get Adam in the room and, and anoint him with some anointing before he passed away. If Adam has authority with God to help grow the church in New Zealand from where he took it over from, it's because he has a secret place relationship with that God that's made him a king. As Stephen Rano with the youth or anybody, as Taramat Seth or anyone, as Tim Lee. If Tim Lee's having authority and he is with the work that he's doing in Vanuatu, it's because of his secret place time. One good thing about living in the bush is plenty of time for that. He's not distracted by any of you anymore. Marvin's in the secret place and it's affecting him and he's being rewarded openly. We live in a society that, it, that all this stuff distracts, particularly this thing here. This thing robs your secret place. This thing robs your secret place. With all its gains, with all its options, with all its likes and don't likes, it robs your secret place. Sometimes you do definitely need to put it away. We lived without being in constant contact with each other. We survived for generations. We'll survive for a couple hours while you go to the secret place. I'll be annoyed when I text you and you didn't return it to me. I'll be the one annoyed, but we'll all be annoyed because we want immediate response, don't we? Just text me back and say, sorry, Pastor Pell's in the secret place. And I'll be saying, oh, I'm sorry, interrupt. Because that's waiting for you and me. I'm going to ask the band to come and play. Jesus did this work to make this possible for us. If you're here tonight and you've never taken advantage of that, you need to come. Jesus says, turn away, repent from the way you're living and be baptised. Come and do what Mark and Vicky did tonight to lay hold of that new life as a king in God's kingdom. Maybe, friend, you've never really considered that you have a kingdom. You just think that's everybody else's responsibility. The youth leader, he's got my youth pastor, my Bible study leader, Pastor Peter, he's got to look after the kingdom and I just get to criticise how they do it. No, you're a king. And they're the priests and I get to kind of question why they do. No, you're a priest. You're a priest. You are a priest with access to the secret place with God. There's a room waiting for you to go and speak to the Father as a priest. And there's a kingdom waiting for you to rule as a king. And I can't rule your kingdom, it's waiting for you. It mightn't be huge, it might be small because the, kingdom's, the, the king of kings is waiting for you to do something with what he's given you. So he can give you more. More responsibility, more power in the kingdom. You know, we have, we have such a power within us and, you know, we do have a desire to take it to more people in more places, in a bigger way. But it's, it's not one man's job. It's, it's all of our jobs. It's all of us to take up the kingdom. It's all of us to take up the kingdom and to take up that authority and to take up our priesthood and take hold of this prayer that we're talking about this month and get with it 
so we can bring the kingdom down. Let's stand. And as I said tonight, or if you're with a visitor here tonight and you don't know if they know the Lord and they've invited his kingdom in their life, the altar's here for them. And my friend, if you're a believer and you're hearing this and if it makes you feel like, oh, then get down here, please. And speak to him and say, Lord, take this burden off me. Teach me so it's, it doesn't seem like a burden to be your king, but that I can do it with your power. You know, the it says in Ephesians that Jesus, when he came, rose from the dead, he appointed us as apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. He has an appointment for you. But two verses before says he, gave, he came with the grace, the measure that we need to carry out the gift that he gives us. He gives you the grace that you need to lead the kingdom that he's given you. If the whole thing's all been too much, you need to lay hold of the grace. It's for you. He'll give you the grace to be the king that he wants you to be and lead the kingdom that he gives you. It's, a, it's, a, it's all win, huh? He says, you're a king and I'll make you, give you the power to be that king. I'll give you access to the Father to, to find out how to be that king. You'll have all the power you need. You'll have all the access you need and I'll never leave you. I'll tie myself to you and I'll walk with you through all of it. You can't lose. We can't lose. You know why we lose? Because we don't walk where we should walk. We don't lay hold of that kingdom. We don't get in that secret place. I love this message. It's guaranteed. Some people are out there tonight selling juices and medicine and all sorts of opportunities and ideas that will work for some people. But I'm telling you about something tonight that will work for every person. It will work for every person that opens their heart to Jesus and allows him to come in and walk, goes through those waters of baptism and then ties themselves to him. Tie yourself to him. Get into prayer with him. Let him teach you how to pull that load that you feel like you've been pulling, that kingdom that you've been given, and he'll make it easy for you because he'll give you the power and the grace to do it. Amen? Let's sing. Jesus is here. He's saying, come to me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you. If you have been blessed by this message, please visit our website, neilthomasministries.com and click on the donate button.